What's going on everyone, it's Justin here and today I've got my three month review of the new 2023 M2 MacBook Pro. So as someone who's used the MacBook Pro 14 inch as soon as it came out, it has honestly been the most complete computer that I've had in my entire life. I know Apple over the years has had all these different iteration of MacBooks and when I first started I used the MacBook Pro and then eventually I also tried the MacBook 12 inch and then there was also the whole era of the Intel MacBook Pros but as soon as Apple Silicon came out, I've been impressed by the performance ever since as well as the battery life and I feel like last year's introduction of the MacBook Pro 14 inch and 16 inch redesign is the most complete to date. So it begs the question, for the 2023 model, what are the changes and is it worth it? For someone who is looking to pick up a MacBook Pro upgrade for the first time, or if you have last year's model and you really rely on your computer on a daily basis, are some of the spec improvements when it comes to the new processor as well as the increased storage options worth it for you to upgrade? So I feel like after three months and after being on the road and essentially throwing this MacBook right into the workflow, I've got a pretty good idea as to whether this computer is really worth it because the one that I have right here and the ones that I've tested out are a good variety of specs. The MacBook Pro 14 that I have right here is the completely maxed out to the rim. M2 Max with 96 gigabytes of unified memory, a 38 core GPU, 12 core CPU with eight performance cores and four efficiency cores, and a 400 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth, which is double from the previous generation. When it comes to the storage options, I went with two terabytes of internal storage, but you can scale it all the way up to eight terabytes of fast internal storage. And some of the other models that we also tested out include the M2 Max with the 64 gigabytes of unified memory, which I feel like is really going to be the sweet spot for people who are looking for great performance in the max model while not having to spend all the way up to the 96 gigabytes. So to brief you on the hardware overall, obviously there is no changes because we just had a redesign last year. And I think this is a really good balance of a MacBook that is quite thin and relatively easy to bring around while not being thin to the point where there's compromises when it comes to battery life and performance. And then they've really nailed that in this generation. And personally, the 14 inch size of MacBook Pro has been my easy easy go to. It really does come down to personal preference in the end. I think when it comes to color grading and video editing, the larger display is still very useful. But if you do like travel a ton and you're bringing a lot of camera equipment as well, then I do think the 14 inch relative to the power that it can provide is really the most efficient option. The display itself, of course, is also beautiful. We don't have to talk too much about this, but this is a Retina Display XDR. It has the best colors and brightness of any other laptop in Apple's lineup, being the flagship model. And with a 3024 by 1964 resolution, that gives you a PPI of 254, and the Liquid Retina XDR display also has the 120 hertz pro motion refresh rate with 1000 nits of sustained brightness and 1600 nits at peak brightness along with the wide p3 color gamut and true tone so every single feature that you have in apple's displays that are like the pinnacle of display technology is integrated here and it is essentially like a portable version of the pro display xdr which is what i also use at home so for anybody who needs like the pro editing workflow and accurate colors on the go and also in your office this is able to achieve that. And we actually do a lot of our color grading directly on the MacBook Pro's display. And the peak brightness is super handy, especially if you're in scenarios that are a little bit brighter and you might have a ton of glare on the screen. The keyboard, of course, is also really nice to type on and everything, but some of the other hardware changes are quite a bit more minimal and are completely under the hood. So you can't really notice from looking at the MacBook itself. You've got the three Thunderbolt 4 USB Type-C ports, the SDXC card slot, as well as an HDMI 2.1, which supports displays up to 8K resolution, which is a step up from the previous HDMI 2.0. And on the Wi-Fi side of things, it also supports Wi-Fi 6E, and the Bluetooth is Bluetooth 5.3, compared to Bluetooth 5.0. These are updates that are relatively subjective depending on what scenarios you can take advantage of them. So say the devices that you're connecting to, um, like the router or the Wi-Fi network, doesn't support Wi-Fi 6E or the generation of it, then you're not really able to take advantage of the faster speeds. But in the certain scenarios, you really do feature-proof yourself and the same goes with Bluetooth. I mean, the previous generation MacBook is one that I feel like if you can find refurbished or used, you can get a really good deal on. But I can't really recommend this MacBook Pro 
M2 as an upgrade for someone who already has last year's model, but it isn't because the upgrades are bad by any means. It's just that last year's computer was already an extremely compelling option. So before we move on, I want to give a huge thanks to the sponsor of this video, Clean My Mac, which is literally the first thing that I install on my new computer whenever I get one. And Clean My Mac fundamentally is able to run maintenance on all the devices, as well as allow me to uninstall optimize and also organize the storage and footage in my computer. Its main mission is to free space by cleaning up junk and cache files, keep your computer free of malware, uninstall the unused apps, and ensure your Mac runs faster, safer, and more organized. Some of the key features include Smart Scan, which is the most prominent feature that quickly scans and optimizes your Mac to ensure it is clean, protected, and running at its full potential. And that is something that I run on my computers each week or right after I finish a big project where there's just a lot of different things going on. There's also malware removal, which Clean My Mac can use to scan your Mac for viruses, AdWords, and anything that could pose a threat to your computer. And it will also work proactively to alert you of any suspicious activities. And lastly, Clean My Mac has a beautiful design that is meant to complement macOS and provide an excellent user experience. One of the new features of Clean My Mac though is the assistant feature. This is able to give you useful recommendations automatically on some maintenance that you should run on your computer on a regular basis to ensure it is always running perfectly. Some of the recommendations include deleting cache files, unused apps, managing extensions and permissions. And this also works in conjunction with the malware removal, which proactively scans your computer regularly. If you guys have been watching your channel for a while, you've known that I've used Clean My Mac for literally a decade now, since the start of my career, and I've had it on all of my computers as a customer. So if you guys wanna go in and have a seven day free trial, I'm gonna drop a link at the top of the description section below with a promo code and a huge thanks to Clean My Mac once again for sponsoring this video. But I think the biggest question now is how big of an improvement when it comes to performance. You've got a whole bunch of different options to pick from in the lineup that it can almost be a bit confusing nowadays because you not only have the M1 Pro and the M1 Max that you're comparing to from last year, but there's also the M1 computers, the M2 on the MacBook Air and the iPad, as well as the M2 Pro and M2 Max. And the reason why I have the Mac Studio here is because I'm also gonna talk about my experience with the Mac Studio, which features the M1 Ultra. And I would say the way to look at it is that the only processor that the M2 Max maxed out on the MacBook Pro is able to compare against is the M1 Ultra, which from a generational perspective can be a little bit confusing. But I think the way to look at it is that this year's M2 Pro has a lot of similarities to last year's M1 Max when it comes to performance power, whereas the M2 Max is the upgrade. Being able to go up to 96 gigabytes of unified memory is great, but based on the high resolution grading and raw file tasks that I was doing in DaVinci Resolve and also Final Cut Pro 10, this is just a scenario that I personally tested in. I'm sure there's a lot of other industries that run different tests that could benefit from the increased amount of memory. But from someone who came from a 64 gigabyte M1 Max MacBook Pro 14 inch that was maxed out to the brim, I didn't really notice any major, major differences when it came to day-to-day -day tasks. But at the same time, I can't really think of any other scenario where people would be upgrading from last year's Max model to this year's Max model, unless I was going for increased memory where there will be a noticeable difference. Last year's MacBook Pro was already able to handle pretty much every task that I wanted to throw at it. When it comes to like general export times of like 4K footage as well as even 8K footage, the differences were probably just around the 10% mark in real world testing. While on the Geekbench benchmarks, the M2 Max Geekbench came out of a score of 2,069 on the single core and 15,200 on the multi-core. And that compares to the M1 Max Geekbench of 1,781 in the single core and 12,830 in the multi-core. The single core score improvements though come in the fact that there's actually two more efficiency cores in the new M2 generation. You're now up to 12 on both M2 Pro and the M2 Max. And this is what can contribute to better performance in like day-to-day -day tasks and simple tasks if you have a lot of them running at the same time, while also giving you about an extra hour of battery life playback. In like a long day when you're doing like web browsing and email, you will notice that extra hour. But when it comes to doing very intensive tasks where the computer is pushed to the limits, I didn't really notice any improvement or changes in the battery life. It was pretty much the same as last year. Apple's overall claim of the new M2 Pro and M2 Max is about 20% faster performance and also 30% faster graphics, which even though the benchmarks do reflect, I think the real world notices are going to be quite subjective. I think what continues to be impressive since last year though is just the amount of power 
power you're now able to have in a relatively portable device in as small as 14 inches. And so I think that's what makes this MacBook so impressive. And as anyone is looking to go ahead and buy a new MacBook right now, I would say the best spec that you could go with is the M2 Max with 64 gigabytes of unified memory. And the storage is going to depend on what you're going to need. And I do think upgrading to the higher end processor model is worth it. But if you don't really think you need all that power, then the M2 Pro is able to give you incredible performance as well. I just really think you can't go wrong with this lineup. The hardware side of things of the great keyboard, as well as the great display, the form factor, pretty solid battery life depending on what you do on it, as well as the port selection really does make this my favorite computer to date. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to go ahead and drop a like, subscribe to the channel, and let me know what you think Apple should improve on their next generation to continue pushing limits of their own silicon on the pro lineup of MacBook computers, and I'll see you all in the next one.